Over the past two or three years, we as historians have concentrated our thoughts on the history of our cemeteries or burying grounds, which more correctly is the origin of some of them. We take pride in our forebears and we can boast those who bore arms in the revolution, the Civil War, the World War I and II, and the Spanish-American War, and King Philip's War. And right up to the present time, of course, we have, we have veterans of the later wars, and we have people fighting over there right now. And we also now have work being done to replace or place properly some of the markers which have been mixed up over the years. We're privileged tonight to have two gentlemen who will introduce their book, Who's Dead in the Civil War in New England? They're both descendants of the Revolution, the Civil War, and King Philip's War. This book will be on display, and we encourage you to look at it. It represents many hours of effort, time, and work to compile this. I'm pleased to introduce James Ahern and Saul Hardy. Great turnout. I'm probably not going to use the microphone That's as fine. much as him. But if you can't hear me, just say, hey, I can't hear you. Okay? And I'm going to let Jim start up. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and it was, it, was, it was true with the introduction. There was uh, many, many hours of work going over the list of uh, who was going to be, who, uh, who we had. We actually was, uh, were working on another book, but we found so many Civil War um, um, soldiers that we decided that there was a book all in the Civil War. And I'm going to start out off by talking a little bit about the music end of the war, which is very important for the war because of, um, of music is a big part of our lives, has always been a big part of our lives, even in the 1800s. And for the marching, for the soldiers, the, um, the, the, the drummers and, and, and all the music was, what was very important for that. Um, one of, uh, well, one of the, the more famous uh, uh, songwriters um, was Henry Clay Wark, War, and he, he, um, he was buried in Hartford, Connecticut, um, and he, um, he, he, he wrote several songs, including Kingdom Come and The Marching uh, uh, Through Georgia. Uh, another very uh, famous um, composer was Julia Ward Howe, um, and she was a poet, and she wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. At her funeral, over a thousand people sang the song. I'd just like to interrupt him real quick because she's buried at Mount Auburn down in Cambridge which is just one of the most beautiful cemeteries, I think, in the whole state. But if you can't go there, go to Rural Cemetery in Worcester. It's just as nice and no crowds. Uh, um, also in Mount Auburn uh, is Edwin Booth, uh, brother of John Wilkes. And I have him in the book just because he's John Wilkes' brother. Uh, but I found it interesting that actually during his funeral, which was held in New York, the stage at Ford's Theatre collapsed while his funeral was going on in New York City. And I just thought it was an ironic thing. And while we were researching this book, somebody told me, well, you know, he saved Robert Todd's Lincoln, Lincoln's life. And I'm like, huh? He said, yeah, during the Civil War in Chicago, Robert Todd Lincoln fell off uh, at a train station onto the tracks while the train was coming in. 
And Edwin Booth jumped down on the tracks, grabbed Robin Todd Lincoln, and pulled him out of the way. So to think that he saved the young Lincoln and his brother killed Lincoln. Uh, also in Mount Auburn is Edward Everett, who was the speaker at Remembrance Day, uh, or what we now celebrate as Remembrance Day, which was this past weekend. Uh, it was the dedication of the National Cemetery at Gettysburg. And he was the featured speaker, and they thought, well, why don't we invite the president so he might have something to say. And Edward Everett, greatest orator of his time, got up, spoke for two hours about the war. And uh, he was followed by Lincoln. Lincoln got up, spoke 269 words. We now call it the Gettysburg Address. Afterwards, Everett, after he heard Lincoln's talk, wrote the president a letter the next week saying, in just a few hundred words, you summed up what it took me two hours to explain to the people. Uh, also uh, buried at Mount Auburn, Mount Auburn is a beautiful place. There's a gentleman called uh, Atherton Stevens, and he was a major in the first mass cavalry, but he was the first Union soldier to enter the defeat of Richmond on April 3rd, 1865, and he raised the Union flag over the Confederate Capitol. And I just wanted to butt in when he mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I want you to go yeah. back. Okay. Um, well, probably one of the most famous songs of the Civil War was a song called The Vacant Chair. And it was about actually a soldier from Worcester, Willie Grout, who was uh, killed in action at the Battle of Balls Bluff, Virginia. And um, there's actually a, a letter that his comrades had written. Um, about what had happened and seeing his 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 uh, his body, um, you know, going down the river. And Henry Washburn from Worcester, he um, he was a, a he was a, a friend, a father of a friend of Willie's, and he wrote a poem um, around the time of Thanksgiving, 1861, um, called the Vacant Chair, and composer uh, George Root. Uh, oh, oh, um, he, um, he, he, wrote, he, he wrote, that was one of the songs he wrote, um, but, but he wrote some, uh, actually, well, some, some more which are really famous in the time, such as Tramp, 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 and the tune is still used today uh, in the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children. Um, he also wrote Battle Cry of, of Freedom with both Northern and Southern versions. George Root wanted to sell the music in the North and the South, and which he did during the war. He made money in the North and in the South. Um, Willie Grout is, we are members of a camp in Worcester of Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War called the Willie Grout Camp. Uh, he was a lieutenant in the 15th Mass, died at Balls Bluff, um, and he went to Highland Academy, which was up off Salisbury Street run by a gentleman named Metcalf. He was only 18 years old and uh, died at Ball's Bluff. His body was returned home and uh, of course Washburn wrote the vacant chair as a poem. Root set it to music. It was truly probably the most popular song during the Civil War. Um, we happen to actually be related to Willie Grout. Um, back in the colonial eras, Willie Grout was a seventh generation descendant of a Captain John Grout, uh, and we are an eleventh generation descendant of Captain John Grout, which we didn't even know until we were already in the group. Um, I'll let him get back. But our boy Willie, we there's a flag at his grave, brand new, because we just put one up last week. So we take good care of Willie. <laughs> yes, yes, very important. Um, well, that's the uh, end of my, my, my music part, but I, I, I also, as I was um, getting prepared for this, I was going through uh, some of the notes and some of the more interesting people, um, and we came across the Peace Convention, which was in, in uh, 1860, which tried to, um, tried to prevent the war, but I think uh, the wheels were already in motion for, uh, for that. Um, and we have several several people from the Peace Convention. David Fields, who was a delegate to the Peace Convention, um, and the br brother of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Fields and Cyrus Fields, uh, that 
that uh, laid the first transatlantic cable. Um, also uh, in Providence is Samuel Arnold, um, who was a delegate and uh, raised to uh, lead a volunteer light uh, artillery battery. And he was also a U.S. Uh, Senator in uh, 1862 and 1863. Also uh, from Portland, Maine, there was William Pitt Fesden, um, who was a U.S. Senator from Maine, um, and uh, three sons of Union generals. Three of his sons. Oh, three of his sons generals. were Union generals. I want to jump in because <clears throat> I'm going to do a whole spiel on bad generals. One of my favorite topics. Uh, but before that, one of my favorite guys in the book, uh, his name was Francis Millet. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you when he died because you might figure it out. And it's the best part of the story. His father was a doctor. And his father thought, gee, I'd like to be a surgeon and the Civil War is going on, and they need surgeons, so I'm going to go to the Civil War. I'm going to learn how to be a surgeon. So he said to his kid, you're coming because you're carrying all my equipment. So, and when we get there, you can be a drummer boy. So the kid says, great. So they go to the war, they get down uh, to Virginia. The father starts learning surgery and realizes fairly quickly that if you're a surgeon, you also need somebody to hold the patients down while you're soldering their arms off, or their legs, or what have you. The kid was a drummer boy, but he grabbed him. He said, come on, you're going to be my assistant. So for the rest of the war, the kid helped his father. When the war was over, he was a teenager, and he decided, I like to sell. I think I'm going to stay. So he stayed, and he became a reporter. He was a pretty good reporter while he was at it. He got better. He became an editor for newspapers. In fact, uh, somebody was telling me just the other day that he was an editor of a newspaper called the Boston Courier. We did that for maybe 10 years or so and decided, you know, when I was young, I always wanted to be an artist. So he goes over to Antwerp, Belgium, and enters the Royal Academy of Fine Art over there, a two-year program. His first year, he wins the silver medal. His second year, he wins the gold medal. He graduates from there, and war has broken out between Russia and Turkey. He says, hey, I'm a reporter. He contacts some newspapers here in the United States. Will you buy stories from them? Yes, they say. He contacts some newspapers in England. Will you buy stories from them? Yes, they say. OK, I'm going to the war. So he goes to the war, works as a reporter at the war, sends stories back. But while he's there, because he had seen what he had seen in the Civil War, there was some injured uh, Russian and uh, trying to think what other country it was. Well, it was Russia and enough Romania. There were injured soldiers that he tended to on the battlefield. He ended up getting medals from both Russia and Romania for his work with their soldiers on the battlefields. He returns to this country and he's a real good artist. Some of his works are at the Baltimore Customs House the State Capitol Building of Minnesota, the State Capitol Building in Wisconsin. Those are both murals. He's got a big mural at Trinity Church in Boston. He's got paintings in the Museum of Art in New York City and in the Tate Gallery in London. In 1893, at the Columbian Exposition, the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago, he's the superintendent of decorations. He's on a trip over to England, over, well, actually to Europe, and he's coming back, and he hears about this new ship that's going to be going on, <coughs> the RMS Titanic. And he decides, boy, I want to go on that new ship, biggest ship ever. He's one of the 150 bodies that are identified after the sinking and recovered, and his body's returned, and he's buried in Bridgewater, Mass. now, uh, at St. John's Central Cemetery. And he was just such a fascinating guy. I always wonder what his last moments were really like. Um, and when I, when I first read about this guy, I was like, wow, what a story. That could be a book unto itself. Uh, <clears throat> because the war had the good people like that, and then it had the bad generals. Nice segue. Uh, bad generals are one of my favorite topics. Uh, because you don't, you know, you don't have to be smart to run for office. 
You don't even have to be smart to be elected. But a lot of these generals in the Civil War were political generals. And you're governor, okay, you're a general. You're a senator, we'll make you general. And there were bunches of them. There's one in a big statue in Worcester next to the county courthouse of General Devens, who at the first battle of uh, Bull Run, as they weren't doing too well, the Union forces, he saw his men heading down by the river, and he was on horseback, and they were all walking. And he rode up to the men, and he looked at them and said, hey, every man for himself. <laughs> and he charged across the river and left them all behind. <laughs> and he's got a big, beautiful statue, man. Uh, just drives me crazy. Uh, our group, our son of the Union Veterans Group, uh, the Massachusetts Department, we recently had a thing for Benjamin Butler, who was a uh, major general. He was a political general. He was appointed by Lincoln early on in the war. Um, he's known affectionately as the Beast. In the South, they call him the Beast. Uh, he was a bad general. He was corrupt. Uh, Jefferson Davis branded him an outlaw. He was the military governor of Louisiana uh, in uh, 1862. The amazing thing about Jeff Davis branding him an outlaw, at the 1860 Democratic Convention, Ben Butler vote, voted for Jefferson Davis as a delegate to the convention to be president in 1860. 57 consecutive times on the first 57 ballots he voted for Jeff Davis. He didn't know they were going to have such a run in later on. He ended up getting elected to the Congress in 1866 and he was one of the House managers during the impeachment trial of Andrew Johnson. And he actually ran for president in 1884 on the Green Baptist Party. Uh, of interest, I mean, he was so incompetent, he can't even get into it. How many died? guys died needlessly because of his actions? Uh, in the South, he looted Louisiana terribly. Uh, he should be called a beast. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the, uh, yeah, well, you make a politician a general, and this is what happens. Uh, good men die. Um, and uh, after the war, uh, he had a checkered past. But I always found it interesting. Jesse James and his gang raided Northfield, Minnesota to rob that bank. The reason they were going to rob that bank was in that bank's vault was Ben Butler's money. And he didn't own the bank, but he kind of owned the guy that owned the bank. And he kept uh, quite a bit of money in that bank in Northfield, Minnesota. And that's why the James boys were after him, because it was the beast. The same cemetery he's buried in, there's another guy, Adelbert Ames, and he's from the Ames Tools, um, which we've all used Ames Tools over the year, very wealthy. In fact, it's the Ames Family Cemetery. Um, he won the Congressional Medal of Honor, this guy, early in the war. Uh, he was badly wounded at the first bull run, but he was kind of a hero at the first bull run. He was actually the first colonel and commander of the 20th Maine, which would end up being commanded by Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. But he was the first commander of it. Chamberlain was the second. Um, he uh, served with them at Antietam, bloodiest day of the war, um, Fredericksburg, and Chancellorsville. After the war, he was a carpetbagger politician. <laughs> he went down and he uh, became a United States Senator from Mississippi. And then he was the governor of Mississippi. He resigned five minutes before he was impeached as governor of Mississippi in 1876, because they were ready to run him out of Mississippi on a right, uh, which I don't know if they did, but they considered it. He didn't die until uh, late in 1933, the year our mother was born. Uh, and when he died, he was 97 years old, he was living in Florida, he was the oldest full rank general of either side to survive the war. Uh, but he was a bad general. Uh, I got Nathan Banks on there. Uh, people will say, well, why do, why do you have him on there? Well, 
who got defeated by Stonewall Jackson in June of 1862 during the Valley Campaign. In August, Jackson beat him again when he was with the Army of the James. He commanded the forces that did capture Port Hudson, Mississippi, but it was a bloodbath uh, before they captured him. And for that, he was voted the thanks of Congress. Only 14 Union officers were voted the thanks of Congress during the Civil War, him being one of them. Uh, during the Red River Campaign, uh, he got us defeated again. Uh, he had command of the Department of the Gulf uh, for about four months, right when the war ended until about August of 1865. But I often wonder, he probably was voted the thanks of Congress because he was a former Speaker of the House. He was a seven-term congressman from four different parties here in Massachusetts. He was Speaker of the House in 1856 and 1857. He was Speaker of the House from 1865 to 1873. And he was Speaker of the House from 1889 to 1891. He didn't seek re-election because he just, he was old and he wasn't feeling well. But they still voted him a $1,200 a year pension. He had also been the governor of Massachusetts right before the war from 1858 to 1861. And he was a U.S. Marshal in Massachusetts for eight years, from 1880 to uh, 1888, before the Great Blizzard. I have uh, Edwin Stoughton, another bad general on here, a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, 17th in his class out of 22. Now we know why he was probably a bad general. Uh, he was Colonel and Commander of the 4th Vermont Infantry, promoted to Brigadier General in November 1862, at that time, he was the youngest Union general officer. Uh, Custer, at some point, would actually be appointed general and would be the youngest Union general. On March 8, 1863, he was asleep. It was nighttime. No problem with that. They were in Fairfax, Virginia. He had a bunch of troops comprised of all Vermont people. And him and 32 other Union soldiers were captured by uh, Colonel John Mosby and Mosby's raiders. He was taken away, he was held at the <coughs> prison in Richmond uh, for a few months, and then he was exchanged. Do um, we have another bad general? It can't be he's the last bad general. Well, I think, uh, I just think the bad generals are as fun as the good generals. And sometimes they're even more, uh, but I want to switch back to him to talk well, about the president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have uh, some uh, people on Lincoln's cabinet to talk about. Uh, there was Gideon Wells, who's uh, buried in Hartford, uh, and he was Secretary of the Navy from 1861 through 1865. Uh, but in his writings, he describes the happenings after President Lincoln's death, including Robert Todd Lincoln crying on the shoulder of Senator Charles Sumner. Also, uh, we've got uh, in Portland, Maine, William Pitt Fesenden, uh, who was a U.S. Senator uh, from Maine, and he was also Secretary of the Treasury um, in uh, 1864 and 1865 <coughs> after Salmon B. Chase. That's what made me think of the bad general, my last bad general. Salmon P. Chase uh, wanted to be president. He was one of, as Doris Kern Goodwin's calls them, the team of rivals. Uh, I have a friend that is descended from Salmon Chase. His daughter, Kate, he, he was kind of a tragic figure. In fact, his picture was on the $1 bill when they started making the green notes. And it was his way of running for president. I'll put my own picture on the $1 bill. And Lincoln's attitude was, I don't care as long as there's money in the bank. Uh, his daughter, Kate, was his hostess, and he had three wives. They all died young. He was really a tragic figure. But Kate married this guy, William Sprague, who was a general from Rhode Island and a bad general. Uh, made some very bad choices at Bull Run. And we were recently at Swan Point Cemetery in Providence. Again, another beautiful cemetery. Um, and the Sprague family, who own the mills down there, have just one of the most beautiful stones. It's got its own plot of land set up on a hill. Beautiful, beautiful. And Kate Sprague's name isn't even on the grave. The 
husband's name is. And the husband's accomplishments are everything. The wife didn't even get her name put on. And just which, I find the little things like that just so sad when you walk around and see it. But it's like when you see a cemetery, a stone, and I'll see, well, born 1843, still alive. Because no date of death. I mean, the family all died off or whatever. And it's common. Uh, you know, I mean, I used to think, what's well, can't be that common. It's very common. And not just civil war veterans. I'm going to let you go on. I'm done with that, generals. Well, uh, you know, going through the book, through a lot of our research, uh, one thing that stuck up uh, out in my mind was uh, the, all, all the, all the uh, heroes that, that we have in the book. Um, there, there's many, many stories, I'll mention a few here, but there's many, many more that I don't have time tonight to mention. But, um, but, but uh, for those of you folks who, who like to purchase the book and go through it, there's, there's many, many heroes. One thing, one, thing, one thing I have to say, and, um, and it's somewhat of an oversight on our part, and somewhat of, we never heard any of the stories, but unfortunately there's nobody from Auburn in our book, and I know Ken is going to give us lots of information for our next printing, so that so that Auburn will be uh, very very well represented. Um, but even I was talking to uh, my brother Tag on the way here, and our son's group has has uh, has graves registration, and we looked up Auburn just to see how many people in it. And there's actually in in the project that the Suns Group is doing, there's actually nobody listed from Auburn, which we know is not true. Um, and we are gonna gonna um, help Ken to rectify that so they can be added into into that. Um, I don't know if yeah, you want to well, add to I'll that. Okay. 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 Um, well, the, the the first hero I I have um, was a. Uh, Levi B. Gaylord, and he was a sergeant in Company A of the 29th Mass Volunteer Infantry, and he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor um, when he volunteered to man an abandoned piece of artillery um, while under enemy fire at the Battle of Fort Stedman, Virginia on March 25, 1865. Also, um, also among the heroes, we have Benjamin uh, Jellison. Um, he was a sergeant in Company C of the 19th Mass uh, Volunteer Infantry, and he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions at the Battle of Gettysburg on July 3, 1863, during the repulse of Pickett's Charge, when he, was, when he captured the battle flag of the Confederate 57th Virginia Infantry. Talking about picket shots, you told me a story about oh, picket shots. Well, when I was about, there, the hills weren't no, so No, about, about you saw something on TV where there was where, just a thing on TV, and I don't know if anyone saw it on either PBS or the History Channel about Pickett's charge, and they actually retraced the steps of it. Because you always wonder, you know, I mean, obviously, I don't think Pickett wanted to do it. Uh, but you wonder why were they slaughtered so bad? Well, you can see they couldn't see the Union guns on the other side when they started heading over. They didn't know the Union guns were all right there. And it goes like this, and you can't see them coming. I mean, you know they're going to be coming from that way. And if you walk it, all of a sudden you walk up, and you're on the road, and the guns are right there facing them. And it was, again, just, it was a bloodbath. It was a bloodbath. Um, I, I, since he mentioned that guy, one at Gettysburg, um, one of the ladies brought in a hat tonight from the GAR, which, is, which was the Grand Army of the Republic, and it was the American Legion of the Civil War. When these guys came home, they formed the Grand Army of the Republic, and you had to be a Civil War veteran to be in it. And then they started a group for the Sons of Union Veterans. We are members. It's our great great grandfather. Um, the GAI ceased to exist, I think it was in the 1940s when the last Union soldier died. But when the last Union soldier died, 
That was the end of the GAR. The Sons of the Union Veterans, we are chartered by Congress in 1954 by an act of Congress. We are now the legal heirs to the Grand Army of the Republic. So any Grand Army of the Republic things that you run across truly belong to the Sons of the Union Veterans. Uh, they do a wonderful job monitoring eBay and website sales. And they're taking people to court. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not such a fanatic on that. I believe if a historical society has GAI relics, they're better off in the hands of the historical society because the sons were a very small group. But the post in Worcester was called the George H. Ward Post of the GAR. It was the biggest post in the GAR, had members from all over the country, and it was named after um, George L. Ward, who was killed in action at Gettysburg. I'm trying to find my notes on it. Killed on the second. He was a brigadier general. Uh, he had lost a leg earlier in the war and went home, healed, and said, I'm going to go back to the war. And he did. He went back to the war and he died at Gettysburg. Um, and he's, he's buried. In fact, the uh, post put up a beautiful stone for him and had a beautiful bust on the top of him. About 50 years ago, the bust was stolen. There's a couple of brass swords on the side of it, or supposed to be swords. Uh, people have broken off part of the sword. We would like to eventually replace it, but we're a small nonprofit too, and, uh, and it's tough. I'd like to keep going on Gettysburg just for a minute since it came up. We have in the book, too, the only known Chinese soldier to fight at Gettysburg. He was a sergeant in the 14th Connecticut Infantry. Um, though there are other known Chinese veterans of the Union, uh, he's the only one known to have fought at Gettysburg. And I have to mention uh, on Gettysburg, uh, my, my buddy Chamberlain up in Maine, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, colonel and commander of the 20th Maine, uh, had been a school teacher, a uh, college professor, went to the war, he was lieutenant, uh, lieutenant colonel, the second in command of the 20th, of Adelbert Ames, one of the bad generals. When Ames got promoted, he became colonel and commander. And of course, at Gettysburg, the 20th Maine is really what turned the battle there, Little Round Top. And uh, they held Little Round Top, and things weren't going good for him during a lot of that battle. They were low on shot, things were bad. But he had read about a maneuver in a book never practiced it, had never even done it. But he had read it in the book. And he said, you know what, I read this thing in the book, and he told his brother Tom, he said, we should try doing this, and it's, uh, I forget the name of it, it's something wheel on a turn. And that's what they did, and they won because of that. They held the battle. But also in the book is a guy, Governor K. Warren. He's buried down in Newport. Never been to that cemetery, but I'd love to go. A yeah, graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, 1850, he was a major general. He was the chief topographical engineer of the Union Army. He was at Gettysburg. And he was riding around Gettysburg, and he recognized the value of Little Round Top just by looking. He didn't have a map. Just by looking. He said, that's going to be an important hill. He went and he grabbed the 20th Maine, and he was a major general. And he told them, you go hold that hill, and you hold it at all costs. And they did. A statue of Gubina K. Warren sits at Little Round Top now on the hill. And uh, the 20th Main and Little Round Top, the 20th Main Monument and Little Round Top are some of the most visited sites at Gettysburg. Um, I, I want to mention one more guy before, I want, before he moves on, because it's a Gettysburg guy. Uh, guy this guy won the uh, Medal of Honor for Fredericksburg. When both color bearers were killed in action, he picked up both flags and continued to move forward and got the Medal of Honor for that. But at Gettysburg, he was wounded during the repulse of Pickett's charge. He was taken prisoner of war, and uh, he was held at Libby Prison in Richmond for a while. They moved him from there, they moved him to some prison camps, one in Georgia and one in South Carolina. Well, when the Union Navy came in and started shelling islands in Charleston Harbor, he was one of a group of Union officers that were taking a foot on Morris Island while the Union warships were bombed. 
by the Confederates. They said, okay, your boys want to come and mess around with us? We're going to stick you out there. He did survive it. In fact, he lived until 1900. I'll let go on to some more of these here. Because there, there were a lot of privates, and there were a lot of bad generals, but there were a lot of heroes. A lot of them related to the flag, saving the flag. But a lot of them, it was just plain courage. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, the next one I'd like to talk about is uh, somebody who, who, who uh, actually didn't just receive the Medal of Honor once, but he received it twice. And his name was Robert M. Body, and he was a, a sergeant in Company B of the 40th New York Volunteer Infantry. Um, and the first time he got the medal was for saving the lives of two Union soldiers at Williamsburg, Virginia on May 5th, 1862. And almost a year later, at Chancellorsville, Virginia, um, when he saved the life of an officer on May 2nd, 1863, which I thought was uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting that that he would uh, he would save um, he would save uh, three people's lives and get the medal twice. And then uh, the next uh, uh, the next hero I have is Joseph Manning, and he was a pri uh, he was a private in Company K of the 29th Mass Infantry. Um, and he got the medal for, uh, for actions at Fort Sanders, and that's near Knoxville, Tennessee, on November 29th, 1864. He became uh, separated from his troops and with, with another Union infantry and artillery troops, he fought off the Confederate attacks. And uh, he, uh, he actually um, jumped into a ditch of the enemy and, uh, and demanded their surrender of the colors of the Confederate 16th Georgia and 200 men, and they all surrendered. <laughs> he was the only guy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he was commanded by General Ambrose Burnside. It's all about his grave. Burnside. Um, I guess. It was, uh, Burnside had command of the Army of the Potomac twice. And he could have been in my bad general talk, too, and I just didn't put him in this time. Uh, he was governor of Rhode Island. He was a politician, but extremely, extremely famous, well-known family. We're at his grave at Swan Point. It is a mess. It is an absolute mess in a beautiful cemetery. It's broken. His, his governor flag holder is in terrible shape. It's pink. Um, and I just think to myself, they're just forgotten. Even though he was commander of the Army of the Potomac twice, just forgotten. Uh, and sad. Just sad. Well, well, in a lot of our research, we've found we found a lot of um, a, a, a lot of graves, gravestones. Um, you know, being uh, being like the one in Worcester. Uh, um, you know, um, the the ward gravesite and so forth. That you know. People have stolen brass things out of the grave sites. Even when we were doing the other books, you know, some of the most famous Americans, um, you know, and no flowers, and um, you know, which which is kind of a sad thing that you know, uh, people of this time, this era, maybe they have more things to do and they don't really, um, you know, you know, don't because I can remember, you know, growing up where. Uh, it was, you know, you know, the cemetery. Going to the cemetery was a was a big thing. Um, it was an every Sunday event. Uh, yes, for my grandmother. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so going back to the heroes, uh, I got John Gideon Palmer, and and he was a corporal in Company F of the 21st Connecticut Volunteer Infantry, and at the Battle of Fredericksburg, Virginia, on on December 1862. He was the first of six men to volunteer to help a gun battery that was being fired upon by Confederate artillery. Uh, for his actions, he received the, uh, the Medal of Honor. It reminds me of uh, some guys who won the medal in, from Rhode Island. Twenty guys volunteered, twenty artillery guys, uh, volunteered to go with some infantry. The infantry said, we'll go and we'll make this charge and we're going to get those rebel cannons and if you come with us when we capture those rebel cannons we can turn them right on the rebel lines and shoot who wants to volunteer well 20 guys volunteered and they went and they did it 
they, they captured the rebel canyons, they turned them right around, and they tore up the Union line. And there's about and you know who one of those 20 was? Who was one of those 20? Archibald uh, Malborn. Uh, and he was in the first Rhode Island Light Artillery Company G. Company G. And and, uh, and and he was one of the ones um, or was one of the twenty who did cross the Confederate lines and captured the cannons and turned them, uh, you know, upon the enemies. And uh, he he he, uh, he won the medal for for doing that. Him and the other 20, 20, uh, 20 soldiers. Another good. Well, I don't think they all won the medal because some of them were killed. Um, but I think I, I think eight or ten of them won the medal. Um, another good cannon story, and Gettysburg again. One of the uh, batteries in Rhode Island is firing at Gettysburg, and their uh, barrel, the end of their barrel, gets hit by a Confederate shell and dents it, and dents it just enough where they can't fire a cannonball out. So they pull the gun off the field. Battle goes on, of course, we won Gettysburg. Cannon's in bad shape. They said, we're going to send it back to Rhode Island and we'll have it fixed. Well, they sent it back to Rhode Island, but they never got around to fixing it. They took it up to the state capitol, put it on display, and it sat there from Gettysburg on, or from when it, when it arrived there on. Well, in 1895, they're getting ready to have the ceremony, and they go. Somebody goes over. They take a look in it. It's still got black powder and a cannonball down the barrel. <laughs> Thirty-two years later, <laughs> so it was safely diluted and put back on display. But I always thought, for thirty years, that's sitting in front of the state capitol building, and never went off. You know, I mean, just you know, it was a different era, apparently. You know. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I've, I've, I've got notes on the youngest soldier of the war, who was Joseph White, and he enlisted as a drummer boy in, in, in New Hampshire, and he was uh, nine, nine years old, seven months, and he served in five battles. Pretty, pretty amazing. So anybody has a nine-year-old who wants to go to Iraq, I hear they're looking. They, uh, I also have... There's a lot of firsts. You read about, oh, he was the first general to get killed. He was the first. But truly, the first guys to die in the Civil War <coughs> were from the 6th Massachusetts. They were in Baltimore. Uh, when Lincoln called the troops, uh, they left um, Boston on April 16th, headed for Washington. And they would be the first troops to arrive. But in Baltimore, you couldn't drive the train. The engine had to be towed. Baltimore. Um, and when the troops got to Baltimore, the citizens of Baltimore weren't very happy. And actually, four Union soldiers were killed. Um, three of them are buried right in front of Lowell City Hall. Uh, there's a big monument there to them. Uh, Luther Ladd, Addison Whitney, and Charles Taylor. The fourth was buried in Lawrence, um, and his name is Sumner Needham. And you might have just seen two cannons were just stolen from the top of his grave in the last couple of weeks. It was all over the local news. And they are not the original cannons that were placed there after his death. They are cannons that were just placed a few years ago that the local historical society raised $10,000 to replace the ones that had been stolen maybe 15 or 20 years later. They were just stolen maybe a month ago down there. So the respect of people is just not there anymore. Um, we have the first uh, Union general killed in the war. He was actually killed in Missouri uh, at the Battle of Wilson's Creek. And they always called him after that the savior of Missouri, Nathaniel Lyon. Never heard of him. You know, I, uh, not one of my fortes. One thing we have been doing a lot of research with is the U.S. colored troops. Um, in fact, at Hope Cemetery in Worcester, there's 15 members of the 54th Massachusetts buried at Hope Cemetery. It's the second largest burial site of 54th Massachusetts troops in the whole United States. The biggest burial site of them is down in South Carolina, where they fell at the Battle of Fort Wagner, um, and where 
from Robert Gould Shaw, I believe is actually buried. I believe his grave in um, Mount Auburn in Cambridge is really what they call a cenotaph. Um, he's listed there, but he's not there. Um, I believe he still lies with his troops. Um, but I hope we have 15 members of the 54th. And we have one member of the 55th. Everybody knows about the 54th Mass, but the 55th Mass was also a college regiment, which today doesn't sound politically correct, but it's the terminology. Um, and there are members of the U.S. college troops from other U.S. college troops at Hope Cemetery. We have about 20 members at Hope Cemetery of either the 54th, 55th, or U.S. college troops. In Lancaster, there's a couple guys from the 54th buried, um, trying to think, it's not old settlers ground in Lancaster, because they're not in the book, I just found them. Uh, but they're buried in Lancaster. Two brothers, their name was Hazard. Um, in Taunton, Mass, is Sergeant William Carney, who in the movie Glory uh, was portrayed by Denzel Washington. And again, had, he won the Medal of Honor related to the flag, the color bearer was shot, um, and he grabbed the Union flag. He had already been shot, um, but he grabbed the colors and pushed forward. You know, I mean, that's the amazing thing. I can see he grabbed the flag. I wouldn't keep moving forward. I'd grab the flag. And <laughs> you know, I love the flag. I'm not going to leave that behind. But, I'm sorry, they're shooting cannons and mini balls and stuff. I'm not moving forward. And hope there's a guy, Tom Plunkett, he won the medal. Um, at the first battle of Fredericksburg, he was the color bearer. <clears throat> a shell went off and blew both his arms off at the elbow. He just bent down, picked up the colors, and pushed forward. I mean, unbelievable. He lost both arms and pushed, he kept pushing forward. Um, but the 54th Mass, they have a, uh, back to the colleges, they have a beautiful um, uh, statue for them on the side of a wall across from the State House. It's done by Augusta St. Gaudens, St. Gaudens. And there's a version of it at the Augusta St. Gaudens historical site of being. New Hampshire. So if you're ever in Connish, New Hampshire, and at the historic site up there, it's a it's another version of it up there. Um, and at Mount Auburn again is Robert Gould Shaw, which I believe is a cenotaph. And then Edward Needles Hallowell, who uh, became commander of the 54th. He was a white guy, obviously he was an officer um, after Fort Wagner. Um, there's also a lot of U.S. colored troops, or not a lot. There's a couple of them at St. John's Cemetery in Worcester, which surprised me. Um, we're of Irish heritage, and St. John's in Worcester with the veterans, it's the Irish Brigade, and it's, uh, you know, the Irish, even after the war, was a lot of no Irish need apply. Um, but I asked them in the office, I said, were these guys black? Do you have any record of that? And yes, they were. So obviously they were, they were two minorities. They were Catholic and they were black. Um, we've also got in the book a uh, Charles Jackson Payne. He was colonel and commander of the 2nd Louisiana USA Infantry. And they were an early U.S. colored troop regiment. And he had a command of a division of U.S. colored troops with the Army of the James. He was the great, great grandson. Uh, no, he was the great grandson. Robert Treat Payne that signed the Declaration of Independence, and he died in 1916. So it just goes to show, I mean, a great-grandson of the Declaration signer lived into the 20th century. Uh, I'll let, oh, you know, what you do now. Okay, um, the next thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is uh, the rebels who are buried here uh, in New England. And there have been some stories that, that there are no rebels. Uh, the last one was moved from Air Mass uh, a few years ago. And that's not true because uh, me and my brother, we were out um, doing our cemetery walkthroughs. And uh, I look over and I, and I said, Tag, 
isn't that a Confederate flag? And he looked quick and he says, yes, it is. So we had to, we had to go look. Oh, I wanted to go, take that You down. know, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was, a, it was a, the, the, the man's name was Henry uh, Abeer. And the interesting thing was, was that the stone was erected by the Weir Mass, uh, the cemetery was in Weir Mass, but the Weir Mass post of the GAR. So I thought that was a very... And this guy was a veteran of the uh, Confederate Army. We, it didn't say what army though, but I always figured the army in Northern Virginia. Because most of them, no matter what they served in, if they survived the war, they would always say, I was in the army in Northern Virginia. Even if they weren't, or even if they'd never been to Virginia. They would say, you know, I was in Lee's army. <coughs> and, 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 and oh, and there's one in Worcester. And there's there, there, there's there's one in Worcester that we we just discovered because we've been doing a walkthrough of Hope Cemetery uh, because uh, we want to get flags on the graves of of anybody who served in the Civil War for um, for Memorial Day next year. So we've been doing a walkthrough and we uh, we discovered that we also um, found a, a couple of. Um, a couple of um, gentlemen from Connecticut, uh, Gustus, uh, Smith, Gustavus Smith, uh, who was a major general, and uh, John Pratt, who was also a major general. So, uh, so, so there are some rebels uh, buried, uh, buried here in New England. And, there, and if anybody knows of any, we're always looking. There's <laughs> another young kid up in Gray, Maine. Uh, one of the officers of a family in Gray, Maine, lost their son. And the empowerment used to work on speculation after battles. Uh, there were many people that followed the armies, including empowerments. And they would take the officers and they would embalm them on spec. And they would send the embalmed body home with a bill. And sometimes the family paid and sometimes they didn't pay. But the family up there had been been contacted, hey, we got your son's body, and, and he's being involved, and we're sending him home to you. And so the train shows up, and the casket's on board, take the casket off. Before the funeral, the family says, oh, I want to see my son again. They open it up. Not the son, it's a confederate. It's a kid. It's a private. And he's all embalmed, and he's laying in the box. And so they're like, whoa. Well, the railroad wouldn't bring the body back south again. They said, we'll bring your son home, no problem, but we're not carrying that back to the south. So the town of Great Maine bought a plot farm, buried him, put up a statue, and put up on the stone, our friend. Uh, which I always found that, it's not in the book, but because I didn't know about it when we were writing the book. But it always moved. The same way with when the wall was over, the north and the south met. And then they'd have re re reunions, reenactments, uh, not so much reenactments, reunions. Those boys didn't hate each other. They, they were old men at that point, and they had all been in battle together. And they had all suffered. Um, and they were glad to have a unified country. There's a great picture of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain at the 50th anniversary at Gettysburg. And he must have been in his 80s at that point. Uh, and he's riding a horse down the street. And he looks as imposing in that picture as he must have looked 50 years before. Uh, we were in Gettysburg two years ago for Remembrance Day, which is always the weekend before Thanksgiving. And when we went, we went to promote the book, and, I'm, and I had called down there. They told me it's the biggest weekend of the year. And I said, how can it be the biggest weekend of the year? The battle's in July. They said, no, this is the biggest weekend of the year. We were there, there were 20,000 reenactors, both north and south. Uh, they were lined up next to the high school. People brought their own horses. I thought, boy, you're really into this when you bring your own horses. Or something. <laughs> Guys, cannons going down the street. I hadn't been to Gettysburg in 30 years. I said to Jimmy, my wheelman, I said, I probably won't even know how to get there now. Hasn't changed a bit in 30 years. I forgot how windy the roads are, so it's very, very, no highway to get to Gettysburg. But uh, very poignant to drive around there. Uh, one of my favorite paddocks. 
Um, I, I also want to talk a little bit about Andersonville Prison. I don't know, you, you probably a lot of you have been over to the Clara Botton homestead over in North Oxford. Uh, it's her birthplace, and uh, it's a wonderful little museum. And uh, really, the woman that runs it, wonderful place. Uh, in fact, I heard she's leaving. She may have already left. She, she has, she's has, gone. Has, has Kathy left? She's yes. just a wonderful person. Uh, but Clara, I lived in North Oxford for a while. I feel like I love Clara. You know, I'm single. I'm divorced. I can do it. You know, <laughs> even though she's dead over 100 years, well, okay, or about 100 years, I just feel like I know her. Uh, at the Barton camp, I had some people that worked there, and I spent a lot of time up there. It's just a wonderful place, and she was a wonderful person. Uh, you know what she did? She she really. She worked in the patent office, but she had nursed her brother who had fallen in the mine. And uh, she would nursed him, and, and she knew that these nurses would need on the battlefield. And she wanted to be right in the thick of it. And it was at Antietam, the bloodiest day of the war. She was so close to the action. Afterwards, she found a bullet hole in her shirt. The bullet had passed right through her dress. She never even knew. Her, her, her dress was so bloody at the bottom. She kept having to bring the blood up, you know. And she went on to found the American Red Cross. She served on the battlefields of the Franco-Prussian War. She served on the battlefield of the Spanish-American uh, And she was an old lady at that point. Uh, now, the Spanish-American War didn't last very long. I understand that. But uh, what a wife. Uh, a few years ago, the patent office building that she had worked in was being renovated. And they found some of her effects from when she worked there. And in a couple of letters, she was talking about, I want to be a nurse in the Civil War. You know? And um, I just think if you haven't seen the Clara Botton Homestead, it's a wonderful little place. And she's buried right in North Oxford. The American Red Cross put up a, a beautiful stone with a red granite cross on the top. And we make sure Oxford, you small towns take good care of you. Being from Worcester, Worcester veterans aren't treated as well. Not because they're not treated well, but if people don't know you're a veteran, then you're not getting a flight. I say to everybody today, and I'll say to this room, if you are a U.S. veteran or you know a U.S. veteran, you should tell them you should put a military gravestone at your grave. No matter if you have it on your family stone that you were a veteran or whatever, because 100 years from now, the greatest generation is going to be forgotten the same way the Civil War guys are forgotten. At Hope Cemetery, 1,500 guys lay in the rest there. Over 1,000 didn't get a flag this year from Memorial. Through no fault of their own and through no fault of the American Legion that posts the flags. You don't have a flag holder, you don't have a military stone, you don't get a flag. It's plain and simple. And when the guys, the guy that does the flagging was in charge of flagging at St. John's for the American Legion Post that does it, he's 86. Okay? And he's in charge, and he's 86. You know, I look at the telegram every day, you know. Um, God love him, because you just, you ask, I ask the Boy Scout troops, some will come, some won't. They're just not interested. They just don't care. And it's not so much they don't care. I understand they got MCAS and this, this, and this, that. But Harry Truman said, you know, those, don't who, those who don't remember history are destined to repeat. 